Check, check.
Test, test. Did you hear me? Okay.
testing. Okay. We're about to get started. Feel free to, I mean, this is very casual. First of all, make sure you've signed in. There's sign in sheets right in the back. Indicate who your professor is as well or your course name so they can double check. If you're receiving extra credit, they can double check the list. There's coffee and cookies in the back of the room. Help yourselves. All right, let's get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to my favorite event of the year. Some of you may have come to this event before. It is one of my favorites. We'd like to welcome Keith Lemnios, the founder and CEO of Sun Coffee Roasters. This is Caldwell University's coffee supplier. So if you've ever had a cup of coffee here in the dining hall, then you have enjoyed Keith's product. It is also being served in the back of the room. Keith's story is inspiring and compelling and um, really teaches us about corporate social responsibility. Um, Sun Coffee Roast Roasters calls themselves coffee with a conscience because that's exactly what they are. They have a focus not on profits, but on sustainability, fair labor standards, and education. And so Keith has come many times in the past. I think maybe this is our seventh or eighth time together doing this presentation. Um, and it's, of course, mostly for the benefit. I invite him to come to speak with our graduate students who are taking BU 649 Law and Ethics. But we open it up to all of our students because corporate social responsibility and business ethics is something that we believe is very important here in the School of Business. I'm so happy so many of you have joined us here today. Pay attention, learn something, ask questions. Um, Keith is a wonderful presenter and he's happy to take questions. And thank you for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Can, can everybody hear? Yes, yes, okay, cool. Um, yeah, we're keeping this super casual tonight. I don't care if you're getting credits or not. Um, and, you know, corporate social responsibility, um, I definitely wasn't born with it. Uh, and I don't know if a lot of people are. It's something that you develop, or I developed over a period of time. So tonight what I want to do is kind of go back to a prior life that I had, my journey to develop this company, um, what we do, how we're different, and uh, then take a visit to a farm in Nicaragua, show you some pictures, put into perspective the, the, the passion, love, compassion that, um, that these farmers put into every single bean of coffee that they harvest, that they grow and harvest. So um, to start off with, question, raise your hand, um, largest consumer of coffee country in the world is? Raise your hand. No guess? Okay. US. US. You got it. First bag of coffee to you. All right. I told you guys, raise your hand. It doesn't hurt to guess. Okay. Largest coffee producer in the world. You can't pick again. Yes. No, they're number three actually right now. You've got it. Brazil. All right, number two. Here you go. Okay, uh, anybody know what a um, venti or no, a grand Starbucks coffee goes for nowadays? This is not a give away, give away question. Yeah. I mean, I would say it's like $5. It's getting there, but it's not quite there yet. That's just for a black coffee. I'm not talking about a, a cappuccino or a latte or anything. Yes. Okay, we'll split you two guys. It's three sixty-five. Okay, go into a Starbucks, three dollars and sixty-five cents. Now for the question for the coffee. What do you guys think? Give me within a penny, um, what the farmer gets from that three dollars and sixty-five cent coffee that Starbucks sells. How much? 
one one cent? One dollar? No. No. Back there? No. 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 One more shot. Two bets. You win. You're the clo you're the closest. It's actually six cents. So think about that for a second. You go into Starbucks with your hard-earned money. You spend three dollars and sixty-five cents for a measly cup of coffee, right? And everybody in the supply chain is making a significant profit from the exporter in Brazil, let's say, to the importer in the United States, let's say in, in uh, Secaucus, New Jersey, which is one of the ports, um, freight companies, coffee roasters, retail operators, you know, like gourmet dining here or Starbucks that you go to, the Dunkin' Donuts or whatever. Um, and everybody in the supply chain is making a real fair profit, probably beyond a fair profit, except for the source of the product which is the coffee farmer. So going into this journey, I just want to give you a little bit of background information. Um, about 145 million bags of coffee are produced annually, which equates to about 21 billion pounds of coffee. 82% um, of it is grown by micro farmers. What's a micro farmer? It's a farmer that owns about less than a hectare of property, which is about two and a half acres. Average yield of that farmer for coffee beans at the, during harvest is about three to 3,500, 3,000 to 3,500 pounds. And a lot of these farmers have less than a hectare of property. They have like a half a hectare, which is about an acre, and they're yielding like 2,000 pounds a year. At a very nominal income for them, it's not financially sustainable for them to be in the coffee business. And this is one of the things that we as a company are trying to change. Um, 130 million people worldwide are in the industry. Um, coffee production has been linked to slavery and child labor over the years. Coffee's traded as a commodity for about 110 years now. And um, you know, up until very recently, there, there's been a lot of uh, you know, child labor going on and you know, basically indentured servants. You know, you, you're born into the coffee, into the farm, you stay in that coffee farm. 61% um, of these micro farmers, which produce about 80% of the coffee produced you know, worldwide annually, 61% are below uh, uh, profit levels. They're working at an operating loss. Got to change that five cents to six cents and the three dollars to three sixty-five, but that's okay. Average farmer age is fifty-eight years old. So basically, that paints a picture of what the industry looks like, and it's not just coffee. I mean, you look at bananas, you look at pineapples, you look at avocados, any um, commodity, uh, consumable commodity in the world, really has the same issues. Coffee just happens to be the second highest traded commodity in the world, second to oil. So it, it, it shines a little more light on that, this particular product. This is the coffee belt. And you can see within this area here is pretty much where all the coffee in the world is grown. Um, most of it from Brazil. Uh, believe it or not, Vietnam is the second highest producing coffee country in the world. Uh, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, they didn't have one coffee tree. Uh, it's not a high quality coffee, but they really did it right and they developed that as a, as a full-fledged industry within Vietnam. Colombia is number three, uh, and then it's followed by Indonesia. Uh, Sumatra is number four. This shows, I come from a Wall Street background. This shows the futures commodity uh, index uh, for the trailing like 40, 45 years. I think it goes back to 1975 or something like that. And you can see the volatility, right? So coffee market is low here in the 50 cent range. Coffee market hits $3 in, in uh, I think it was like 1977, 1978. Then it comes back down to 50 cents in the uh, mid 90s. Uh, up again, down again, up again, down again. The interesting thing about this chart and the reason I show it 
is that the farmer doesn't participate in the fluctuation of the market. They're getting their constant right now, six cents per pound, per, per cup on, that, on, the, on their coffee, okay? Who's making the money are the commodity traders on Wall Street and the SIBO in, in, in Chicago. And they want nothing but volatility. As a trader, you make money when the market goes up, you make market when the money when the market goes down. So what the last thing they want is a flat, consistent market. And it's com completely contrary to what the farmer wants. Because the farmer wants a consistent price <clears throat> across the board, but a higher income level than what they're getting right now. And right now, coffee prices are, are going back up again. They're over $2.20 for spot May, May contract. And the farmer's not participating a penny in that. 70 countries producing coffee. I told you about Vietnam and, okay. So out of college, I went to Wall Street. I worked for seven, you know, five, six years uh, as a, as a uh, institutional trader. Um, had the opportunity to purchase a, a, a business in Connecticut. Just happened to be in the coffee industry. I knew nothing about roasting coffee, processing coffee, cupping coffee. I knew the green side because I had friends that traded uh, in the New York Futures, uh, the New York Composite 100, which is right next to the coffee pit. They introduced me to you know, all these guys. So I, I, I really got a good concept of what the green market was all about. But I knew nothing about roasting coffee. It was an opportunity to set up my own business, do my own thing, be my own boss. So I bought it. And it was pretty small at the time. It was like a half million dollar in revenue. Um, grew it over like a 10, 12 year time frame to like 25, $30 million, um, organic growth acquisitions. All I cared about was margin. I wanted to buy the highest quality coffee at the lowest price I could pay and then get the best spread when I sell it to my customer. And it was, it was a pure business proposition on my end. And I lived in the McMansion house and my kids were all in private schools and driving the Mercedes, you know, living the great entrepreneurial life. And about 12, 14 years ago, more than that, now 18 years ago, believe it or not, I, I can't believe the time's fly, flown so fast. Um, I built a new facility to consolidate two roasting plants and a distribution warehouse in Connecticut. And they're cleaning out the basement of the company that I bought, right? And the company was founded in 1937. So what happens? They bring up this box from the basement. It's got all these invoices in it from 1947 and 1948. Now, I remember like it was yesterday from Peru, Guatemala, Brazil, and Colombia. I've got them in my left hand. And in my right hand, I've got invoices from the same regions of the same countries probably some of the same families two generations later and there was a one cent price difference in the coffee and that's like that's when it hit me it sounds corny but it was like a just hit me with a brick uh, like what am i doing okay I, I i i'm living this like privileged life never chose to talk to a coffee farmer never thought about what their issues were uh, i just cared about myself my family and my employees and um, so I started thinking about it, like, okay, I want to do something. I don't want my tombstone, my kids to say, you know, this guy was uh, an a-hole. Uh, so I, I, like, I said, I'm going I'm to figure this out somehow or another. And um, first thing I did was I reached out to over 400 farmers uh, worldwide. And the interesting thing was none of them have computers, but they all had cell phones. So... As I'm reaching out, I ask them a simple question. I'm a coffee roaster in the United States, not big, not too small. Uh, what can I do to help you? And there were three common denominators, like whether they were from Indonesia, or they were from Kenya, or they were from Ethiopia, Honduras, Nicaragua, Brazil, Peru, El Salvador, all these countries that we, we partner with. Um, and the, the three common denominators were one, living wages, as opposed to fair trade wages, just to give you 
be a quick one, fair trade. I have a whole talk on that separate than this. Fair trade coffee right now uh, is priced at, I think, 210 or 215 a pound, meaning we pay a premium for fair trade coffee. That premium is supposed to trickle down to the farmer. Problem is that the break even, because we do an analysis with all our micro farms, uh, the break even for a farmer right now is about 245 a pound. So for every pound they sell as a quote unquote fair trade coffee, they're losing about 30 to 40 cents a pound, which makes absolutely no sense to me. So I, I didn't want to go just the fair trade route, even though we are fair trade certified. Um, so living wages, going back to what I was talking about. Uh, number one, um, which would provide health care, housing, clothes, food for their families, um, everything that they need to you know, live a you know, somewhat normal life. Um, second was education. Where we buy our coffee, there are thousands of micro farms, uh, but they're typically in the rainforest. And the, the, the source of schooling is very, very limited. So none of these farmers have an opportunity to really send their kids to school. So what happens in Peru, in, in the forest, your child, which is part of their culture at eight, nine years old, starts working the farm. They work till their late 50s, which is their life expectancy. They die, the next generation comes in. So we wanted to commit to help in educating their children at their you know, locations, wherever they are in the world. And the third one, and we'll get a little bit more into this later, um, is the environment. Um, most of these farms are in the rainforest. And what they were telling me was ma macro farms were coming in and buying 500 hectares of property. They were clear cutting the rainforest and they were growing coffee. And some of them was organic coffee, which again, like doesn't make any sense to me uh, that, you know, you're putting a premium on the coffee, but you're clear cutting the rainforest to do it. So it was preservation of the rainforest and then best practices on growing coffee in the, within the rainforest uh, to maximize yield and maximize uh, quality so that they could get the highest possible price for their coffee. So living wages, education for their children, and rainforest preservation. I'm going to try to play this. I'm going to put my microphone there just to see if it works. If it doesn't, then it's OK. So what happened with me? I've got this huge guilty conscience going on that I want to do something. I quite couldn't figure out how to do it. Like I couldn't, if I just went to fair trade coffee, you know, all my customers were diners and restaurants and convenience stores. None of them really care about fair trade coffee. So I had to align our business strategy with a consumer that aligns with our values, which happens to be you guys. Um, so I sold my business. Um, I took close to five years off. I went up to Harvard for a couple of years to get my master's degree because I, I just didn't know how to do it myself. And I, I just made that as my project um, at, for, for my degree. And I spent two years up there and I was like the grandfather of my class, you know, for 20 years older than everybody else. Um, but they were very sympathetic and, and they were actually very helpful to my fellow students in a lot of studies that we did. Um, and when I, came, when I was there, I was at a pub, this was like the first month I was there, and I met this guy named Simon Sinek. I don't know if you guys, anybody familiar with who Simon is? Okay, Google him, follow his TED Talks. He is, I think, brilliant. Um, but he, I was, we were at this pub and I'm talking to my classmates and telling them what I'm trying to do and getting their ideas. And he's sitting next to me and, and he goes, you know, I, I have, um, can I join your conversation? And I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, who are you? And he said, I just finished a book um, called The Why. Um, and um, it, it really changed when we started talking and I took him on as a mentor. Um, it really changed the way I looked at business, the way I looked at profitability, the way I looked at social responsibility, and helped me develop the strategy of our business 
to be successful as a business, because we're not a nonprofit, still do the right by the, uh, the farmer uh, with their main concerns and align ourselves with the right partners as customers. Yes. It's Cynic, S-I-N-E-K. S-I-N-E-K, -E yes. I'm gonna give this a shot, guys. I don't know if it's gonna work or not, but I'm gonna put the microphone on this. I'm gonna play like five minutes. Can you guys hear this? It's about 17 minutes, but play five. And this is the book that he wrote is based on the how do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Because year Apple, after year so after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight. The Wright brothers beat them to it. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked. And it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way. And it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging this. Why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. 
But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products. And nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. That was the catalyst for everything that I've done since. Build our strategy on our why, and then target a market that believes in what we believe. And not everybody believes in what we believe, and I get that, okay? But to be successful, to have social responsibility, to be able to make change in people's lives, that was the direction that I wanted to take the company. So um, got out of school, raised some capital. Um, oh, wait a second. And um, we started. And environmentally, we set up a very state-of-the-art uh, coffee roasting plant. Uh, we run between, uh, we have zero emissions. Most coffee roasters have emissions. Um, we run at about uh, 4 million BTUs, uh, four, I'm sorry, 400,000 BTUs of natural gas an hour, uh, where the industry standard for any equipment the size of ours would run at about 4.5 million uh, BTUs an hour of natural gas. So we are extremely efficient on energy use extremely high quality in the type of coffee roasting uh, facility that we've developed. Um, and I, I didn't want to screw up what the farmers do. And you'll see some pictures a little later on. So what did I do? I set up my golden circle. Our why. Our why, we exist. I wake up every morning. My, everybody at my office and in my plant think about this on a daily basis. We have conversations about it. We communicate with farmers uh, to provide living wages for farmers. Uh, we committed to education for farmer children, and we took a little bit of break during COVID because it was a very difficult time. Um, and uh, but we have built over 50 kindergarten to fifth grade schools in very remote regions of the world, um, and we are committed to continuing that process. And we're not changing the world, but if we can change one child's life. Uh, or one family's life, then I, I consider our company as a success. Uh, and the third is uh, pres uh, preservation of the rainforest, which we developed a um, best practices methods on uh, growing coffee within the canopy of the rainforest. We actually coach the farmers on maximizing yield, like I said earlier, and maximizing flavor. Um, what's our differentiating proposition? Well. We just, I decided, you know, and I looked at, we did a, I did a demographic study before I got out of school, and we looked at, um, I don't know, I think three or 4,000 people, and the demographic of the mission-driven consumer back then, and this, it's expanded since then, um, was the 18 to 30-year-old male and female. They were the ones that would go to the grocery store, and they would look at the label and say, okay, even though fair trade is not the greatest organization in the world, it's, they, didn't, they wouldn't know that. Uh, it's fair trade, I'm gonna buy the fair trade product. Um, so uh, as I looked at that demographic, I'm like, okay, where are a lot of these people? They're in colleges and universities. So I broke down the college university market, Starbucks, Pete's, you know, some, of the, some local roasters, uh, but it was basically Starbucks and Pete's. And we all do the same thing really well. We all have great coffee. Uh, we all have equipment, which yours is broken, by the way. Um, and um, we're fixing it Friday. Uh, we have equipment, service, delivery, marketing, all that good stuff. So, you know, that's not a differentiator. Um, so that wouldn't be in that outer circle. Um, 
but in, what, what I decided to do was actually develop a program. So we're about education on the farm. I want to be about education here as well. So the first thing we did is created a curriculum. It's 14 week coursework uh, on sustainable and fair labor practices in the, the um, coffee industry. Developed it with a professor from MIT for myself. And um, it's being used at Ivy Leagues, Yale, Cornell, uh, Harvard, um, as well as community colleges. So it's like the full spectrum. Even some, uh, you know, six to 12th grade schools are using it. Um, after that, I decided, okay, well, I want to do this. This is the funnest part of what I do. Um, go to schools, talk to students, faculty, and engage them even more than they are already engaged by supporting the product. Um, and understand, you know, by pouring that cup of coffee over there and dining, you're actually affecting somebody's life on the ground in Nicaragua or Sumatra or Honduras. We have a student ambassador program. We have an internship program. So the interns that we have uh, every semester, we've got between 20 and 25 interns. I developed a pro forma model. Um, you know, the, the farmers have no idea what an Excel spreadsheet is. So we actually developed this, this Excel spreadsheet on um, cost of production, uh, what they need as a living wage. Well, you know, so we partner with them to come up with the number. And what the interns do is basically they, they, they do the legwork on gathering the information, inputting the data. We just finished the study in Papayan, Colombia, uh, which is in southern Colombia. There's 12,000 micro farms in this very small area. And I think they, they spoke to about 100 farmers. So we you know, selected 100 farmers that are within that region, came up with an average cost of doing business. And we've we priced the coffee based on this pro forma model, not what the green market's doing, not what the fair trade price is, but what the living wage needs to be for these farmers to be sustainable and financially sustainable. Um, we have all the certifications. Um, so like I said, we have the ambassador program. Um, there's a whole bunch of little things that we do that are very different. But you know, those, those are the main ones. We have a scholarship at every school, so we give back financially. Uh, we'd like that scholarship to go to you know, somebody in one of your courses. Um, but, um, you know, it can really go to anybody that cho the, the school chooses for it to go to. It's based on volume, so we give a percentage of our profit back. Um, just so you guys know, and I'm not a hero, but I'm, I have the luxury of not having to, like, make money for myself in this company. So I really do this because I love doing it. And my employees are very well taken care of, full benefits, paid extremely competitively. Um, our farmers are making their profit and it, it, the model works. Okay. I never in a million years when I was at my old business would think a model like this would work, but it actually works, but you have to work it every day. You, you can't, you can't just like set up the strategy, forget about it. And then, you know, hope for the best uh, two or five years down the road. It is hot, isn't it? <laughs> um, so this is our differentiating proposition, our why, our differentiating proposition. We just happen to sell coffee, okay? We could be selling rubber tires. We could be selling, you know, bananas. Um, this works with every business model. But you have to know what your why is, and then you have to align your why with your audience that actually believes in what you believe in. Value systems have to be the same or very similar. So sustainability, you know, Webster de definition, um, ability to maintain is a certain rate or level, avoidance of the depletion of natural. I added financial resources in this in order to maintain an ecological and financial balance. So there's everybody when I when I talk about sustainability at schools, you know, I like I'm like, okay, what's your definition of sustainability? Everybody raises their hand, and it's about the environment, right? Which makes sense because that's all we talk about. When you think about it, these farmers don't have financial sustainability. Forget the forget the the environmental sustainability because they're going to close up shop 
in Papayan, they're going to move to Bogota and drive a taxi for a living. So we want to make sure that we start with a financial sustainability model, and then we look at you know how eco-friendly they can be in their growth and harvest of their production of coffee. And we live that in our own business in Connecticut as well. Um, so financial sustainability, people process, I'm not going to bore you with all this. Um, but basically enough money to be able to, to live a life not in poverty. Environmental sustainability, reforestation. So we talk a lot about reforestation with, with these farmers, natural fertilization, because they're not necessarily organic certified, all these farms, but they, they use natural fertilization. To become organic certified is very expensive. And if you screw up once and you lose your certification, it's like almost impossible to get it back again. So, you know, we like organic certified farmers and we work with them, but we also work with non-certified farmers who use natural fertilization methods on, on their farms. Talked about our place. So, with all that background, let's talk a little bit about the farmers, their lives, what the process is for, the, for, for what they do on the ground in all these coffee growing regions. So my first trip, this was, I don't know, two or three years after I started the business. And up until then, by the way, I'd never been to a farm. Like I told you earlier, I never talked to a farmer. Um, since I've tried to go to at least three or four origins a year, just came back from Brazil. Um, and um, uh, I, I really make an effort to engage with the farmers and to, to see it one-on-one. -on -one. It's a lot more impactful for me to actually engage with them physically as opposed to on the, on the phone or uh, through social media. Um, so Managua and, and uh, Inotega are northern Nicaragua. So we're going to take a quick trip to uh, Inotega. Uh, volcanic soil, elevation 12 to 1,500 meters, um, and uh, some of the best coffee, I think, in the world. Um, so we, we, we land in, um, in Managua, and somebody picked us up, and we drove, you know, 100 kilometers, which took us half a day because uh, the roads aren't all that great. Um, and we keep going by these red cafes. I'm like, you know, I mean, after I saw like 10, 15, 20, finally asked, like, what, what's the deal with these cafes? And, you know, this is one of the problems that farmers, micro farmers especially have. So cafes are coyotes. Everybody knows a coyote with, you know, sm human smuggling um, and, you know, all the issues that, that are going on in the world right now. But the coyotes in the coffee industry and they're in every coffee growing region. Um, and within each coffee country, they're like spread out everywhere. You can't go, I couldn't go like five kilometers without seeing one of these. And here's, here's the deal in short. Coffee's harvested. Once the coffee's harvested, it has to go to this beneficio. And what the beneficio does is finishes the coffee, completely dries it, deep, uh, skins it, because uh, there's, a, there's a, an outer, very thin skin on the coffee, bags it, and then goes to the exporter, right? That process has to happen within 48 hours of harvest or else the coffee ferments. And if the coffee ferments, you can lose your entire, you know, pickings for that day. So if you pick 300 pounds of coffee and five beans in the 300 pounds, which there's thousands and thousands of beans, uh, ferment, the whole thing's gone. So what do these guys do? Well, closest beneficio happens to be 50 kilometers away. I've got a donkey in my back. Can't get it there. So that's a huge problem for these farmers. So what, what these guys, what they'll do is they'll go to the coyote and they'll say, you know, got 300 pounds of coffee or, you know, 130 kilos of coffee uh, that I, I harvested today. Uh, what are you willing to pay me? And they kind of look at each other, and the coyote says, eh, I'll give you 28 cents a pound, when the going rate of what we would pay 
is 295. Okay. Now the farmer has to make a choice. Do I sell it for 28 cents or do I allow it to ferment and lose everything? Guess what? They sell it for the 28 cents. So it's really, it's a pickle for these farmers. And we have helped with transportation in grouping micro farmers together and then purchasing vehicles where they can get the coffee to uh, the beneficio. Um, but it's still a huge problem. And we're, we're working with farmers on that, even though it's not part of our why, it's part of what we do. Um, so this is what a typical farm looks like uh, that we engage with. It's the rainforest. Within the canopy of the rainforest are the coffee trees. Very difficult to grow coffee in the rainforest because coffee loves sun. And in the rainforest, you've got nothing but shade. So, because uh, a coffee tree will only grow from like six to 12 feet. Um, so the, within the shade, it, it's again, very difficult and it needs a lot of nurturing uh, for it to grow. Uh, on the left side here, you'll see a red cherry. When coffee cherries are red, uh, they're ready for, for harvest. So coffee tree blossoms, then it grows a uh, green cherry, and then it turns to a yellow cherry, and then it turns to a red cherry. When it's red, it's ripe, and it's ready to be harvested. And you can see like a little skim, you know, like a honey finish on that. That's what has to be taken out, cleaned and dried in that 48 hour time frame. From the time, if, it, if the, the seed uh, sprouts on the right side, from the time that seed sprouts to the time it yields coffee for the first time is typically three to four years. So these farmers are constantly replanting. Typical life of a coffee tree is 16 to 18 years. Um, so they're, they're, they're pruning all the time, but they're also replanting all the time. Inside the cherry, and it's a fruit, by the way, uh, there are two seeds. Each seed is a, is a coffee bean. And the, the fruit itself, the, the skin, is extremely sweet. It's actually delicious. In, in Colombia, there's a plant that takes all the skins and they make juice out of it. It's, it's super good. I asked them if I could import it, but they, they, I couldn't do it. Um, so this is what the inside of, of a red cherry looks like. Here's some just baby trees. Okay, I kind of like this picture because this is during harvest, right? And you can see the different color beans. There's yellow, kind of yellow. They're turned mostly green. Um, and then there's the red cherries. What's your name? Brian? Brian. Ryan. Okay, so Ryan's our our coffee picker today. He's, he's going to be harvesting coffee for us. Uh, he's my son. And uh, I sent him out to the field and he can walk maybe a mile, a uh, couple kilometers into the rainforest, up a steep grade, uh, no paths, okay? Um, and he's going to choose an area that's about 25 feet by, let's say, 25 feet. And he's going to harvest the red cherries every single, you know, for, for an entire day. I mean, he's there at six in the morning, he's working until six o'clock at night. Then the next day, he's gonna go to another area, 25 by 25. Two weeks after you go to this first area, you're gonna go back because those green cherries are gonna to start to ripen and you get another round of red cherries. You're gonna do the same thing again. Eight, 10, 12 hour day, you're gonna pick the red cherries. Two weeks later, you're gonna do it again. It's going to take Ryan four months, four months to pick all the red cherries off of one coffee tree. Okay. And I'll give this to another professor here. That, that four months of labor, you do the math sometime with the, 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 the billions of pounds that are sold annually, that four months of labor yields one pound of coffee. So the, the, it's mind boggling to me and it's all manual labor. There's no automation. It's not like the orange grows where they shake the trees and the oranges come flying down. None of that, all right? Some of the macro farms have some automation but even the macro farms don't have automation uh, for the most part. And um, so it's literally billions of man hours 
to harvest all the coffee that's consumed worldwide on an annual basis. For what? Less than six cents per cup of coffee that Starbucks gets. Doesn't sound right to me. This is uh, one of the, one of the uh, people harvesting coffee. This is Maria. She kind of blew my mind when I met her. Um, she'd work literally 10, 12 hour a day. She walked about you know, two kilometers with that bag on her back of harvested coffee. I tried to lift it. Bag's about 200 pounds. She probably weighed 130 pounds, right? And I couldn't go 10 feet with it. And she walked over a mile in, you know, in the rainforest with that bag on her back. And I said, Maria, can, you know, if you have time, can we spend a couple minutes together? And she's like, she's like smile on her face. Sure, I'd love to talk to you. And I was like, I blew my mind to be honest with you. I was like, okay, this is something's not right here. But she sat down with me for a good 45 minutes to an hour. We talked about her life, we talked about her children, we talked about her husband. Um, and she was happy because we had already engaged with this farm um, that she was making a living wage, even though she was putting so much sweat equity into, into her farm. Um, she knew that at least now she was getting paid properly. And one of the first schools that we built, and I'll show you some pictures in a little bit, uh, were on, at this, this farm location where there are all these micro farms in the area. Um, so her children were both in school. Her husband worked the farm with her. Um, they were making a living wage. And really it was, you know, we were satisfying needs that they had on the ground in Nicaragua. This picture, and I won't spend a lot of time on all the pictures, but this, this, uh, this is Pedro. So I met Pedro when he was actually working, went into the, into the rainforest and, you know, we started talking and um, I noticed his hands. You can see both his hands are like, like this. He had carpal tunnel in both hands. He's considered the number one coffee picker in this whole region, right? He's been doing it for like 40 years. And he took such pride in that. I said, Pedro, wh why can't we figure out, you know, get surgery and, you know, take a little time and then come back? He said, you know what? I already explored that. And I'm afraid that if I have the surgery, it's going to take me a year to recover. And I may not be the number one picker in this region again. Uh, again, just like. Whoa, you know, you, you, so he worked in pain all day long. He goes, by the way, look at my hands there. He couldn't straighten his fingers out. He, my hands are in perfect, you know, position to be able to pick cherries. And they were, I mean, his, he, like his fingers were like this and he was able to pick cherries like nobody else. Um, and that's Pedro. At the end of the day, what they do is that all these different farm mi micro farms gather in one area. Um, and they measure how much coffee each of them produced, and that's how they get compensated. Um, this is the only automation in this area of Nicaragua, and it's a depulping machine. So basically what you need to do once the cherries are, are harvested is to take the pulp away from the, the, the cherries. The, which, the cherries are the coffee beans. And it can be done manually, but it's really difficult to do manually. And all this is, it's very low tech. It's, it's a screw conveyor, right? So it's got a screw that just turns. Ton of water, uh, spring water from the mountains uh, is, goes over it to flush the uh, skins in one direction and the, the coffee beans in another. So you can see how uh, this is, you have some cherries here still, but you can see that oil honey finish. That's again, what needs to be cleaned in the 48 hours. So they use a lot of spring water, a lot of mountain water, um, which they pool and actually use to irrigate their trees. So they really don't waste anything. Um, this is high tech uh, cleaning process to scrape some of that honey off before it goes to the beneficio. They, they put built you know, cement with rocks in it and they rush water and the coffee over the, the rocks to scrape off as much as they can in house before it goes out to get finished. 
and then they scoop, they bag. Coffee skins go one direction, and um, the beans go another direction. So real quick thing on the, on the skins. Um, on the right, you'll see they're red, and on the left, they're, they're getting darker. The darker the, the, the skins are, that's when they're ready to be used as fertilization. So how do they do that? They've got one room that's about, you know, pillar to pillar, that deep, and it's got these channels in it. And the channels are about three feet high by about four feet wide. And they put the skins in there. And I know nothing about earthworms, but they add earthworms to it. And from my understanding is the earthworms live for about a month. They poop, they die, they become fertilizer. Um, about six, seven years ago, Skidmore College, somehow they, they, I think I did one of these talks, and one of the PhD professors, you know, real bright guy, uh, got in touch with me through dining. They wanted to build an earthworm farm on campus. So I'm like, look, I don't know anything about earthworm farms, but I got a guy for you in Nicaragua who never went to school one day in his life, but he knows earthworms like nobody else. And put the two of them together, and a year later, Skidmore College had a functioning earthworm farm. So I, again, found that fascinating that this highly intelligent person was actually being taught by this person that didn't have a day of education in his life, but really knew what they wanted to accomplish. Um, so that's the skins with the earthworms. So the water goes, like I said, a lot of water is used. Uh, they put them in these uh, uh, pools, and then they put this... Uh, uh, I don't know what's it called, pectic en enzyme or something like that. And it, it's, a, it's a, a, a natural cleaning agent. And then they literally have a one horsepower motor with bamboo shoots that pumps the water up back up the mountain, you know, somewhere between 200 and 400 meters. And then it trickles down and irrigates the trees. So that's their high tech irrigation process. Um, reforestation and rainforest in particular, there's a lot of dead wood. So they're constantly using the dead wood um, for uh, cooking and heating. Uh, this is the beneficio. So once the coffee's finished at the farm, go to the beneficio, they put it on these long drying beds. And you can see in the background, those are all bags of coffee that are anywhere from, you know, 150 kilos up to 500 kilos. And um, there's this thin skin on the outside of the coffee bean. And it's called chaff. And that chaff has to be eliminated or removed. Otherwise, when I roast the coffee or anybody roasts coffee, it's extremely flammable. You, you, it'll, it'll catch on fire like the first few minutes of the roast. So that needs to be cleaned. Well, how do they clean it? You've got young men like this and women like this with brooms because it's so brittle when it dries out. They flip the piles. As they flip the piles, the chaff separates from the bean, and now you have a clean bean. Again, going back to all manual. Um, I don't think this is going to work, but no. Then on top of all this sorting and cleaning process, uh, they have people like this uh, young man who actually sort the beans. So they go through one bean at a time and look for defects. So if it's a chipped bean, it's got a borehole in it. Um, if it's an odd size, uh, they separate it. Still gets sold, but we purchase the ones that have no defects. Uh, and then we're even to pay, able to pay more money for that particular coffee. This is their kitchen. So you see your dining in here. Uh, this kitchen will feed about 1,500 meals a day during harvest. Um, this is their high-tech oven. It's not a Vulcan or <laughs> anything, anything fancy. Tortillas are their main uh, uh, source of food with bean soup, um, heated by dead wood from the rainforest. Uh, we help fund this, a small health care clinic on this, in this particular area. Um, you know, anything major, they have to go to the hospital, which is about 30 kilometers away. But, you know, a stitch or whatever they're able to take care of here. Um, these are some of their certifications. This is their Excel spreadsheet. So these are different families. And there's a total of 723,000 trees in different stages of growth 
in this particular area. And each of these families are in charge of a particular sector um, uh, within, within this region. Um, the, uh, this church was built before we got engaged with them. We did help sponsor uh, this building here. Uh, we've sent up until COVID, we were sending students to Nicaragua for like a four day stint to actually work the farm. And um, students responsible for getting there and back, but once they're there, they're picked up, they're fed, they work their butts off uh, because they basically work harvest. Um, it's right in the middle of harvest season. If they're you know teaching uh, major uh, or medical major, you know they can work in the healthcare facility or they can work with the school team. Um, to me, this is what it's all about, and that's the students. The kids are so respectful. They have such a thirst for knowledge. Um, they, they're just, they, they warm my heart. And really, for no other reason that I'm doing this business and I'm in this business is when I see the, the, the look on their faces to know that they're in school getting an education up until fifth grade. And then sixth grade on, we're helping them with transportation to get to the closest, you know, sixth to 12th grade school. Uh, which could be like 100 kilometers away. But we, we, we decided to, to, the, to engage in kickstarting the education program and then worrying about the, the ongoing education. Um, every time we go, there's a big party. I bring all kinds of stuff that I shouldn't bring, like Skittles, uh, the pinata party. They're like any other kid in the world. Pinata breaks and everybody's diving for the floor, uh, going after, uh, after the candies to break. Um, this, so that's the school that we sponsored, uh, about a year in, they said, okay, the school is fantastic. We're very appreciative, but you know, the, the six year old son is staying home with a three year old daughter during the day because there was no preschool. So they identified a building. We, we outfitted the building. They hired the people, uh, to, to work with the children. And now they have a fully functional pre preschool and a K to five school. This is my buddy, Superman. This little guy is the cutest thing in the world. He had, for, never saw a sticker in his life and like popped it on his face sitting next to his big sister. And he was like happy as a clam. Um, this one gave me the dirty look for a long time. She thought you know, I was like a foot taller than everybody else. And she, she thought I was like this bad guy. And but then we finally warmed up to each other uh, when she got her punch in her goodie bag. But um, uh, again, for me, the, the, uh, above the fair labor and above the rainforest preservation, to see these children be able to thrive instead of being indentured servants, which they would have been, um, they have an opportunity now for an education to maybe go back to the farm with knowledge and help grow their farm or do something completely different. Um, but at least they have a choice now. Um, this is our plant. I won't get into it, but very high-tech roaster. There were seven of these built. I worked with a designer for a month before we started uh, to build this thing. Six are in Tokyo, Japan, roasting Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee, and we've got the seventh one. Um, these are our cleaner scrubbers. We have zero emissions, um, where typically... A roast you will have, you can have up to 28% particulates per cubic foot. And most roasters will try to burn that off and it'll get down to 11 or 12%, but like nobody gets to zero. We're probably one of five or 10 roasters in the US that has this kind of system. Um, coffee grinder, which is again, very high tech, it's water cooled. There's maybe 20 of these in the United States. I won't get into the details of that. Um, and that took a whole hour, sorry. Um, or pretty damn close. Yeah. Uh, sorry. It took so long, but, um, yeah, so that's, so that's, what was my journey. Right. And it's, it's, it was, it's, it's very fulfilling and I love what I do and I love the results of what we do as a company. And, um, you know, we're going to keep doing it until I don't know when, but I will never sell this company to anybody, you know, at five years, 10 years, whenever down the road, to anybody that doesn't align with, with our mission and is committed to keeping the legacy going of what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish. That's it, guys. If, there's, if you guys have any, I know I kept you a long time, I'm sorry. Uh, if there's any questions or whatever, you can ask now or you can come up afterward and you know we can talk.
Keith, can you talk a little bit about Silly Cow and um, the hot chocolate and any other pieces of the business? Yeah, Silly, Silly Cow is a company out of Vermont. You may have seen them at the grocery. We're in like 18,000 grocery stores around the country, and we export to Europe and Canada. Um, it's a pure hot cocoa. It's non-GMO. It's gluten-free. Um, all our products, which is it's pure, it's sugar and cocoa, um, is not, is is um, ethically sourced, and we have it's actually direct trade. So we have all documentation on what the laborers are getting, uh, and making sure that we're doing the right thing. Um, company, I did a B round of, fine, of a cap raise uh, right before COVID because we were growing at a pretty good clip. I had some treasury shares. So one of my board of directors was buddies with this guy who was an M&A guy. And, you know, we met and he really loved what we were doing. So they bought, I don't know, 10, 11 percent of the, of the business. Um, and two years prior, they bought Silly Cow 100 uh, percent as company in Vermont, which was really floundering. And um, they asked me for like over a year, well into COVID, um, to take over the company. And I was like, guys, I got my hands full right now, but, you know, I'll do it for equity. Right. Why not? Um, so, again, I'm not making any money at it, but I have equity in the business. Um, we are growing again at a really good clip. It's actually growing faster than Sun Coffee. And, um, and it aligns. It aligns with what we do, you know, ethically sourced, fair labor practices, uh, uh, paying proper living wages, uh, pure, no chemicals, uh, no additives, non GMO, gluten free. So, does, does it align perfectly? No, but it, it aligns very closely with what we're trying to accomplish as Sun, but a completely different market. We're only in retail with Silly Cow, um, and we're only really in colleges and universities with Sun Coffee. So we're wholesale here, we're retail here. And retail has been an experience. How many countries do you offer the, the uh, <coughs> coffee producers? Uh, probably 20 to 22. You know, mostly Central South America. So think of Central America, you know, Honduras, Guatemala, uh, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. Not as much Costa Rica because they, they're actually doing really well, the farmers there. So we, we don't engage heavily in Costa Rica, Mexico. Um, and then when you go into El Salvador, Peru, Brazil, um, and then Africa, we just partnered with uh, in Burundi and Rwanda with female cooperatives, 100% uh, female farmers. In Rwanda, it's a it's a it's a tragic story, but it's like a it's a heartwarming story. Um, all the you know in, in their culture, the men work the the farm, the women stay at home with their family, right? Um, well, what happened 25 years ago was a genocide. All the men were killed. So now these women who knew very little about what to do in the field had to take over the farms and their quality of coffee was like here and it went to here over the course of a couple of years. And then companies like ours, governments uh, invested in education and um, these farms, are they, they, these women are so powerful and they inspire me so much. Uh, they've, they've come back and they've got unbelievable coffee. And they're they're just they're just great people, and so we we decided. And, and more that story is more related to Rwanda, but uh, in Burundi we do the same thing, and in Peru we have all female cooperatives as well. Um, and then in Indonesia we buy a lot of coffee from the Sumatra region, um, Kenya back in Africa and Ethiopia. Um, so yeah, we're in, we're engaged with. I mean, we're literally engaged with tens of thousands of micro farms. Because one micro farm is 2,000 pounds, 3,000 pounds of coffee. That's, that's what Caldwell buys in a semester, right? Or two semesters. Um, so that, that's not going to really cut it. You know, I'm in Montclair down the road. And, you know, they'll, they'll go through, rifle through eight, ten thousand 10,000 pounds at one school. So we, we need to have several micro farms to, to be able to, to fill our supply. Yes. So how does what you do um, go, like, how does what you do translate into, like, the accounting side of your business? The accounting side? Yes. Don't ask my, don't ask my accountant. 
if he doesn't like me so much. Um, it works. The model works. There's, there's enough margin in this thing where we can make a fair profit, even you know, with all the stuff that we do, um, giving back. Because it's not just about fair living wages. You know, we're, we're sponsoring these schools. Each school is costing us upward of ten to $15,000 to kickstart it. We do children's libraries, which are about $5,000. So we're giving back. But even with that, we're, we're making margin. If I was purely worried about the accounting side and the margin side, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be doing what I used to do. And, and, and that, that model works as well. It's just not such an ethical model as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh. We are not a nonprofit at all. I looked at Annette being an NPO, and actually, as a for-profit, for you know, and I can't give you all the reasons right now, but I have more flexibility to do what we're doing. Um, I didn't have to report to any government agencies. I didn't have any special tax filings, um, 501c3s, and all this stuff. That, so I, I, you know, I decided early on that we wanted to make this a for-profit business. And that's the fascinating thing about the business, is you can have a for-profit business, do all this good stuff that I think we do, and still have a profit at the end of the day, right? Now, that profit would be a lot bigger if we weren't doing all this other stuff. But we chose as a strategy to do this. Um, I don't know if I the question, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm sure like the, the conversation of, of how to pick the beans or the cherries, um, like how to make that easier. And I, I know like Pedro was okay with having his hands like that, but I'm, I'm sure like maybe other ones. I wasn't okay with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it like really bothered me and, and I, I think about it still. And every time I see the pictures, I, I you know, it's it really, it's, it's, it's tragic that he, 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 but that was his choice. Okay. Yeah. He had the opportunity to have the surgery, but it, that, that was his choice. I'm sorry. I interrupted your question. I completely understand. Um, is there a way, like, maybe this has reached the topic of conversation at your company, but maybe like, I know automated is not, not too easy to get your hands on, but has there been a conversation of, how can you scale that idea down and maybe do like a scraper or something? Like what is, what is that? Yeah, it, it, honestly, you, you have to, I don't know if I just did something. Uh, you, you have to go see the process because when you see the process, I, I can't think of a way to automate this thing. You know, it, I mean, I, I've seen shake, you know, like in, in an orange grove, you see the shakers and the, the, the like umbrella thing that goes underneath and it catches all the oranges. You, you're, you're in literally in the rainforest with, you know, on a, on a slope like this, okay, hanging on with a rope sometimes from a bigger tree, and you're, you're, you're picking these cherries. I, I, just, I don't know. Uh, they, I, they have shakers for some of the macro farms, like I said earlier, but um, for, for where we partner with our farmers, I, I can't I, I don't know how it can be automated. And, and it, if somebody could figure it out, they'd be very wealthy because, you know, it, it's a huge industry, right? And I'm sure a lot of thought has been put into it. I haven't really explored, you know, different ideas, but I, I just know by when I go there that I can't imagine any kind of automation. What about scaling down that idea of not, not having it Yeah, but when you when you looked at that branch that had the red and the green cherry thing, okay, so you have a red one here, you have four green ones, you have another red one over there, you have another red one over, there. you know, you're literally analyzing every branch for for the the ripe beans, and and you know the, you you don't want to pick the green ones because they're not fully developed. So, I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. Anybody else? Yes. So basically what you do is that wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. First of all, you, you asked me the most questions, so you get a coffee. <laughs> well, I all can right. the first question. All right, all right, all right. Well, I've got them all up here. So you guys, all, I want you all to grab coffee on the way out anyway. But go ahead. I'm sorry. So, so basically what you do is that you have a company, um, basically selling coffee and what you do is you 
from your business, you provide livable wages for the farmers? We provide, we provide livable wages for the farmers, which we negotiate with the farmers instead of having some arbitrary number picked by fair trade or the, or the green futures market. It's really the number that they need to be financially sustainable. Okay, So that's one thing. We give back and help building all the schools that we built. We do other projects like the health care faci uh, uh, facility that we sh I showed you earlier. Um, in the dormitory uh, area for the students that, that I showed you earlier. But um, yeah, that's that's basically what we, so we take it and we, we give back financially to the schools. So, you know, we take a small percentage of our gross sales for each school on an annual basis. And that goes back to the school in form of scholarship. Small school like Caldwell might be a few hundred dollars. Um, a large school like a Montclair or a Rutgers uh, it could be several thousand dollars. Uh, but that's what I'm saying. That's that's the fascinating part of this whole thing is you think if you're doing all this stuff, there's no way you can make a profit. Right. And that's that's what that that's that's what I like blew my mind when I was like looking at this initially. There's so much money in the industry. That, you know, it, it's, it's, instead of like keeping it all ourselves or as much of it we, as we can, you know, we want to share some of that. And we, yes, we could, I could be making a much bigger profit than we're making right now. Um, but we're not an N NPO and, um, and the model works as a for-profit business. Yeah. You had said in the beginning that you had like a backstreet and wall and background in Wall Street. Have you ever thought to bring your company to the stock market so that you could pump a little bit more money in? Kind of Too, small. Too small. Too small. Yeah. You, you, you need to be, we need to be like a hundred million something like that. And we're not working near that. Um, uh, you know, we, I have private uh, investment. I mean, we don't need any funds right now. So the, 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 the first couple of years were tough, you know, cause we had no business and we had like this huge CapEx and, you know, we was like, okay, so when's the revenue going to start coming in? And, and we committed to all these projects on at farms, right? So money was like flying out. And then about year four or five, is when it started catching up. And then we were in great shape. 2019, I mean, was our best year ever, right? And, and when, I, when I was developing the strategy of the business and we picked, selected our target market, colleges and universities, I thought to myself, oh my God, what, what better customer could I have? They've been around for hundreds of years. They pay their bills on time. They never close until March 15th of 2020, when you all closed. So our revenues, you know, going back to your accounting question, because my, my accountant wanted to kill me that year. Um, our, our revenue went down 97% for 18 months. Okay. I, I don't even know how we survived it, but we did. And with that, we were still funding schools and we were still buying coffee because I felt guilty. You know, we thought we had it back here in the States. Look at the death levels um, percentages in like Central America. Okay. Um, so not only did they have COVID, but nobody's buying their coffee because the markets weren't, you know, there. I mean, the retail market did okay during COVID, but for the most part, you know, the, the average consumer, the retail shops that were brewing coffee, a lot of them were closed. They were open limited hours. They were open for limited people in a store at a given time. So they, they, their, their sales in, in all the coffee growing regions went down significantly. Um, and we com I committed to our partners that we would continue to buy coffee. So I was buying coffee. It was coming out of my nose. Um, but we did it. And again, my accountant wasn't too happy about it, but it was the right thing to do. And it's paid back. You know, it's, we, we, it, well, coffee can age very well if you know how to process it once it's like a year old, you know. One more, yes. I'd rather not tell you that, but it's higher than, it's higher than 10 million and it's lower than 35 million. How's that? I, I'll give you a window. It's, it is tax day, so if anybody hears, you know, IRS, I, I want to know. All right. Yes.
What, what other kind of company or, or industries? You name it. Apple Computer. Okay. You know, they, now they're not as socially conscious, I think, as we are. Um, but, you know, you look at virtually every vegetable and fruit. Okay. Tomatoes out of Mexico. Uh, avocados out of South America. Uh, bananas out of Africa and, and Central South America. I mean, pretty much every commodity has a, a labor, a, a, an income issue. And, um, you know, we, we can't solve the world problems, but, you know, we, we try to put our thumbprint a little bit on the coffee industry. It was I got to come closer. I've got old ears. You know what? Um, this is going to sound kind of cocky and bold, but we don't have a competitor because nobody's really doing what we're doing. Everybody, the barrier to entry is zero. Everybody can do what we're doing, but nobody is. There are companies that sell fair trade coffee. There are companies that sell organic coffee. Everybody sells premium coffee. Um, none of those are differentiators. What we're doing on the ground in coffee growing regions and what we're doing with our target audience in the U.S. Um, are extremely unique. There's not, there's not a company out there. That's why when I, when I first analyzed the college market, I saw oh, Starbucks and Pete's. How am I going to compete with them? Never going to have the marketing dollars that they have. Never going to have the capital that they have. So I can't compete with them on a we have good coffee, you have good coffee. And I don't want to compete with them on you have a high price, we have a slightly less high price. Um, that's why we developed this program for the colleges and universities. Um, I know like harvesting cacao beans has a lot of the same uh, problems. What has been the crossover and how has your company uh, kind of like mitigated this? Okay, I, I heard the, 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 the coffee and the cocoa. Is yeah, like the, the hot chocolate. They, they really have the same issue. They really have the same issue. And it's, it's all done by hand, you know. And um, uh, there's just nobody's developed a better way to do it. And I, which you figure with all the innovation out there, somebody would figure it out. Um, that's not my job. Uh, you know, all we can do is, you know, pay these farmers properly for what they do. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it, but it's very similar type harvest. Wow, that was the best questions I've had all the time. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your patience. And um, if you need to get in touch for anything or if you have any follow-up questions, you can send them my email. He has an internship program through, his, um, through the company. And um, you can't Yeah, we're, we're, booked, we're booked for the fall already. Um, so we're, we're going to be looking in the next couple months for spring semester next year. And what, what happens with 